own designer, locally adapted seeds. Um, the other thing about saving your own seeds is you can select for your desired traits. Um, do you like that color of that tomato? Do you like the flavor of that pepper? Was that lettuce just super easy to grow and you know didn't bolt very quickly? Um, so there are things that you can select for and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, also very importantly is you can control, you retain control of your uh, food supply. If you have seeds, you're better off than a lot of people right now that don't have their own um, way of, of gardening and growing, saving their own seeds. Um, you can uh, develop and preserve strains. A lot of the um, open pollinated varieties are not focused on uh, by seed companies. They are um, growing hybrids, which will not produce fruit that's true to the parent plant. So um, we can uh, focus on these beautiful heirloom varieties like the, the tomato in the first slide. That is not a shippable tomato. It's tender skin and it's, it would not hold up well shipping, but to take it from your garden to your kitchen, there, you know, the flavor cannot be beat for some of these old varieties. Um, we'll also be preserving our, own, our plant heritage, genetics and biodiversity. And um, there's a lot of um, uh, varieties that were grown um, in years past and because of things like shippability, boom, they just, they don't do it anymore. They don't, they're not grown. You don't see them in the grocery store. I mean, when's the last time you saw an old school tomato at the grocery store. They're just, uh, it's harder to find them. But if you save your own seeds, you have that uh, opportunity. Saving our own seeds helps save our pollinators. When we let plants go to seed, they have flowers and those are frequently um, favored by uh, pollinators. You see bees and small little moths and lots of other little wing creatures that um, will uh, visit those uh, flowers. And we build community through seed sharing. Um, what is nicer than to get a gift of seeds from a friend that grew and saved those seeds? So um, I know we're not having very many seed exchanges right now, but um, you can share seeds within your gardening uh, friends. Okay, so I thought we'd take a minute to go over what was in your seed drying kit. Um, hang on, let me grab my kit. So hopefully everyone found some sort of a bucket or container with a lid to put their, uh, to build their drying bucket. Um, the things that are in there was a bag of silica crystals, which you will open up and put in the bottom of the bucket. And then you will cover those silica crystals with the paper towel that was in there. And that just adds a little barrier between the silica crystals and the seeds that you're going to put in there to dry. Um, if that way, if you spill the seeds or something, they fall out they're gonna be uh, in the, on top of the paper towel. There's also some coffee filters and we'll go over that, um, the use of that. And um, I think we included, did we include these little boats or paper plates? Nope, everyone was okay. asked to bring a paper plate though. Sorry. Okay, so yeah, small, uh, the, whatever you use has to be able to fit into your bucket or the container that you chose. Um, so these work well, these are little paper boats or a small dessert size paper plate, the smaller one. Um, you can also use uh, little canning jars like this. You'll, you'd put the seeds in here and take the lid off and your, your little container could sit on top of the paper towel in the bucket and uh, leave it open so that the seeds would dry down. Uh, probably the most important thing that was in there in your kit it's called a dry card. And this card is sensitive to moisture in the atmosphere. And uh, when it's wet, it's pink. And when it's dry, it turns blue. So that 
would go on top, someplace in the bucket on top of, on top of the seeds or next to the seeds, kind of leaning against the seeds. Um, but this is going to be uh, critical to really tell if your seeds are dry enough to then take out and store in a container in the refrigerator. And these actually make nice little containers to store seeds in the refrigerator, always labeled. I'm going to talk about labeling seeds a few times because it's important. And yeah, um, then uh, we also um, gave you, sent you some uh, seed saving documents, uh, which hopefully you had time to review. And um, I think that's it. I think that's it that was in your seed saving kit. Okay, let's go over uh, some of the seeds of uh, the terms of seed saving. So open pollinated plants or seeds, they are um, a variety that when they're allowed to cross pollinate only with other members of their same population. So if I had a, um, say I had an open pollinated sunflower and I had several of them uh, near each other and uh, they could be cross pollinated by uh, insects or wind. And as long as they're the same variety and they cross those seeds that they produce should be uh, exhibiting the same characteristic traits from the parent plants. Um, and those are the types we want, that's the type of seed we wanna grow, either open pollinated or heirloom. Now an heirloom variety, they're all open pollinated. The difference with them is they have been cultivated uh, for generations usually uh, from uh, within a family um, or a community. Um, I think of something called Nana's fingers, which is a hot pepper. They must have looked like somebody's Nana's fingers or something. So, and there's lots of these old um, darling names from uh, old heirloom varieties that have been saved and treasured and loved by the people that took time to save them and keep them going. Uh, a hybrid is a plant or a variety created by crossing two stable, genetically distinct parental populations. That means um, I had one sunflower that was yellow. I had another sunflower that was a deep burgundy color and I crossed them um, or they get crossed you know, in the field or um, however they get crossed. Um, if I were to save those seeds and grow them out, they might not look like either parent. Um, and those are called F1s. And you see mostly that's what's in seed catalogs, unless you're dealing with uh, companies that specialize in open pollinated varieties. Uh, Self-pollination is the transfer of pollen from an anther to a stigma of the same plant. Um, and in seed saving worlds, we call those selfers. Uh, peppers are selfers. Tomatoes are generally selfers, but doesn't mean they can't cross. You can cross them or they can, can get crossed, um, but uh, generally they're um, uh, pretty easy to just stay in their own little um, um, genetic bubble. Cross-pollination is when uh, two different uh, plants, the pollen of one plant onto the stigma or flower of another plant, and that's just cross-pollination. Okay, so when we are planning for uh, growing things that we will let go to seed or let some of them go to seed, um, you're gonna start with open pollinated seeds like we talked about. And it's nice to start with plants, uh, kind of like what you were sent, the seeds you were sent, tomatoes, beans, lettuce, and cucumbers. Those are all easy to save uh, plants. Um, but you want to, a plan for giving these plants a little extra space. You might need to do things like um, when I grow lettuce and it's gonna go to seed, those uh, lettuce plants can get three and even four feet tall. So sometimes I'll put a tomato cage around uh, lettuce that I'm planning on saving, or they might need a stake, or they might need to be grown on a trellis or near a fence. Um, if you're growing beans that are pole beans, uh, you're probably already growing them on a, a fence or a trellis or something. Um, so, and then uh, seed crops take more time. Uh, you're not going to be harvesting them like you would for eating. You're going to be 
uh, letting them get, letting the fruit get mature. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later, knowing when to harvest uh, plants, uh, vegetables and fruits for seed, um, because they're not all the same. Not all vegetables have seeds that are ripe when the fruit is ripe. Uh, and then you're going to want to know how to dry label and save seed. And we will go over that. So when we have plants that we're going to be selecting for uh, seed saving, we want to look for things that um, we don't want to take just anything that's growing and fruiting. We want to select for uh, some of these characteristics, um, vigor, hardiness. Um, did it do well in, at your garden or was it struggling the whole time? Um, earliness, was it the first tomato of the, you know, of your crop? Um, that's important, especially in cold climates where, you know, the farmer that gets his, uh, mark, his crop to market soonest is, they do really uh, better economically. Um, the disease and pest resistance, very important. Uh, tolerance to heat, dry, or wet conditions, depending on where you live. Um, heat is a big one right now. I'm selecting uh, for uh, broccoli that's heat tolerant because it doesn't always do well and we have uh, in, in hotter climates um, or the hotter time of the year. And uh, with global warming, that's a consideration. Um, you might want to select for, um, say you had, say you planted 20 lettuce plants and um, a bunch of them bolted uh, pretty quickly, but then there was a few heads that just took their time and they, they, they held a long time and then they started making a seed head. So that would be a consideration for the home gardener. It's nice to have a lettuce that takes, that holds its shape a long time. It doesn't bolt quickly. What's that? Oh, bolting is when the lettuce plant stretches and starts to form a seed head. Um, and then other traits that you could select for would be color, flavor, productivity, storage ability, um, flesh characteristics, and size. So if I had a tomato plant, you can see, um, uh, well, well, we'll start at the end. The, the red tomatoes at the far left side, uh, they're not tomatoes, the red peppers, um, that's a pepper called pizza pepper. And we're trialing that at the, the farm. And I noticed that some of them had this fine brown cracking on the skin. And it didn't affect the flavor, but it, it was a little unsightly. So I started selecting for peppers that did, they had good size, they had good color, but they didn't have cracking on them. So that's one thing I was selecting for there. Um, the tomato in the center is Old Brooks and that's the tomato we'll be um, featuring in our demonstration. I can't say enough good things about this tomato. For one, the first thing you notice is the size of it. Those are the biggest tomatoes I've ever grown here, hands down. I haven't grown any tomatoes. Um, I've been on Hawaii Island about 30 years and I've been gardening almost all that time and I've, only grown mostly cherry tomatoes. And that's what, when I moved here, people said, oh, you can only grow cherry tomatoes here because the others get stung. So these tomatoes have not gotten stung at all. Not at all, not one. I don't know what's going on, but they didn't. And I've also grown them at my home garden. Um, uh, and in my home garden, I am closer to guava. Um, Vivi grows uh, not too far from me. And I don't know why, but they're not stinging it. The photo on the right um, is, uh, I'm not sure if this is Canasta, but it's, I think this is one of Glenn Tevis's um, trial plots. Um, but I was growing a lettuce called Canasta. And it was funny because I was also trialing uh, two or three other types of lettuce. And the Canasta would not bolt, would not bolt, would not bolt. Finally, it started to, like after the other lettuce varieties were long, uh, producing seed heads. This was still in the garden, you know, just firm. I could have harvested it and made a salad that day. So it was kind of annoying when I was trying to save the seeds from it, but the value for a home garden is immense. These just, they call that it holds well. So anyway, there's some examples of things that you can, uh, traits that you can select for. 
So um, eating ripe versus seed ripe. When are seeds ready to harvest? So some things, uh, tomatoes and peppers, uh, they are, the seeds are ripe when the plant, when the fruit is ripe, which works out great because you can, um, you know, cut the plant, uh, cut the fruit off, uh, cut it so that carefully so that you can save the seeds and then eat the fruit, the pepper or the tomato. Um, but some uh, varieties need to be overripe for eating. And some examples are cucumbers. That's the big yellow. Um, they're like, they look like bloated yellow cucumbers on the left side, uh, but those are seed ripe. Um, next is an eggplant. Same thing with eggplant. It you have to leave it on the plant much longer till it gets overripe for eating, but the seeds would be uh, ripe. For harvesting. Uh, lettuce is another one. You can see this is a lettuce that's gone to seed and all of those little seed heads uh, underneath the, the white fluff is a seed pod. And I can um, show you an example of, of how I harvest that. And then on the far right, these are uh, uh, soybeans and they also have to dry on the plant. Um, if they can, they'll be overripe. You wouldn't want to eat them. They'd be tough. But um, uh, if they can be left on the plant, weather permitting, you want them to stay on as long as they can until they've reached their, you know, as far as they're going to go. The pods will be brown. Um, what was I going to say about, uh, oh well. So if, but if it's raining, you'll have to cut the seed pods um, probably a little, as late as you can without them being out in the weather. And then you would bring them in the house to dry. Okay, so these are some examples of um, seeds that can dry on the plant if weather permits. So we have okra, lettuce, all kinds of beans, sun hemp. Um, and like I said, if, if, it's, if it's rainy while your seed heads are forming or your pods are forming seeds, you may have to bring them in to dry in the house. And here are some other, um, these are examples of what we consider dry seeds. Um, seeds, uh, these are seeds from plants that um, you can just save them dry, drying on either a, you know, a plate or a, a, on a coffee filter or in a little jar like I showed you. Um, all of these, uh, families, the lettuces, beans, Asian greens, um, carrots, flowers, all of the brassica family, herbs, green onions, and lots of others. Um, um, over here on, in the photos, so you see lettuce on the top left, carrot on the top right, and then down below we have cilantro, and lower right is broccoli. Uh, those are from the plants I'm growing at the demo farm. And so for processing dry seeds, we're going to uh, cut over, we'll do a little, I'll show you a few um, examples at my other station. Um, but basically for processing dry seeds, you're just going to cut the seed heads off or pick them off the plant when they're dry. And then working over a bowl or plate or a cookie sheet, you're going to remove the seeds from the seed pods. And then you'll arrange them on a single layer on a plate. Um, you could dry them for a few days up to a week in an airy location out of the direct sun. And then uh, always label and date your seeds. And then you can move the seeds to your drying bucket uh, with the silica crystals and put the dry card that I showed you on top uh, inside the bucket. And after they've dried down sufficiently, probably at least four or five days up to a week or more, depending on how moist they were when you put them in or what you know, sometimes bigger, like a bean seed might take a while because there may be a little bit of moisture still inside. Um, so, um, but when that card, that dry card turns blue, you'll know your seeds are dry and then they can be moved to the refrigerator in a tightly uh, sealed container and labeled and they'll store there for years, uh, depending on the seed. Different varieties of plants, the seeds have longer storage ability. And then remember to um, 
eventually you'll need to reactivate your silica crystals. They get to a point where they get saturated and they won't uh, absorb moisture anymore. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that at the end, uh, reactivating. So uh, let's go to the other camera and I'll just give you a brief uh, demo of some dry uh, seed examples. Go ahead and set up. Um, just do a demo. Do a demo. Okay. Oh, wait, you're still screen sharing. Okay. Sorry. Hang on one second. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Is there a way okay. to see Shauna's screen bigger? So the, the best thing for you is in your view mode, everyone, you click on speaker view and then it'll only show Donna as your full screen. So you don't get the grid pattern. Is awesome. that what you're together? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I can also pin her video for everyone. That might work too. Okay. How are we now? Good? Perfect. Okay. Well, our first example is, this is lettuce that's gone to seed. And there's, okay, and there's a, there's a couple ways to do lettuce. If you have a lot of lettuce, you can um, put the seed, the, you can bend the plant, the top of the flowering lettuce plant into a, a paper bag and bump it inside the bag and the ripe seeds will fall out. But a lot of times um, I don't have that opportunity. So this is how I do lettuce um, myself. I pinch off the seed head, the seed pod. What's that? I'm just getting closer. And you see the little white fluffy stuff at the end? I put my fingers over that and I pinch it. And then I pinch off the bottom seed pod and well, things got a little damp out here. We've had a lot of rain this morning. And then if you just kind of roll that seed pod between your fingers, the seeds will fall out. Yeah, let me show you another time. Um, so here's the, here's the seed pod with the little fluffy white part at the end. I pinch that off. I switch my fingers so that I can hold onto the seed pod and I twist off the white fuzzy stuff. And then over a little container, oops. Just to open it up somehow. <laughs> Normally it's dry and you can just twist it and it, they pop out, but it's a little damp here today. And there we go. And in a few, just two seed pods, I probably have, you know, I don't know, 20, 20 or 25 little lettuce seeds. And there, if you do it this way, it takes a little bit longer, but there's almost no chafe. Um, chafe is what we call the other plant parts, the plant material, the, the fuzzy stuff and the brown parts. Um, then when that happens, you have to uh, separate them with um, wind or blowing on them if you want to clean it. So, okay, so that's lettuce. Here's another example of an easy seed to save. This is marigold, and um, when these are easy to find on the on the plant, they're the dried flower heads. They were a flower, and then the flower has. Um, grown and died and now what's below where the flower was is a seed pod and these are simple you just uh, tear them open there's all the seeds and again one little seed pod gives you plenty of seeds to save for your next planting 
with extra to share with friends. And that is marigold seeds. Okay, now we'll talk about germination testing a little bit, but um, I found that for some reason my, my uh, marigold seeds have a very poor germination rate. So when I plant them, I double up when I plant them. Here's another um, example. These are sun hemp pods and they're super easy to save. You just um, open the pods and there's the seeds. Sun hemp's a great cover crop. It's a good crop to grow for your compost pile actually. Um, you can either kind of crunch it into your bed and chop up the plant, or you can um, harvest it and put it in your uh, compost bin. Here's another example. This is a purple wing bean. Normally this is harvested when they're very small and tender. And, uh, but it, since I knew I was saving these for seeds, I let it grow to its full length and dry down the pod. And in this case, I would just crack it open and peel it open and there's the seeds. So these seeds can go onto a plate with a label um, or I have these um, seed cleaning screens, any kind of a screen that's uh, big enough that it won't uh, allow the seeds to fall through will work. Um, another example I have is okra. And this uh, one okra pod has many, many seeds in it. You just open it and there's the seeds. You can see them and they fall right out. They're super easy to save. Okay. So that's our uh, examples of uh, dry seed saving. And uh, we'll go back to the PowerPoint now. Just a quick shout out to Amanda Ryu who's doing the camera action. Thank you, Amanda. From Malai and Waimea. Yeah, she puts up her <laughs> This is great. Now we're gonna change screens. Yep, she's back to the other screen. Let me just ask if I can hear you. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Right. Okay. Oops, it's not moving to the next screen. The next slide, I mean. Oh. I was doing right here and it was working. There we go. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about saving wet seeds. Wet seeds are things like um, cucumbers, tomatoes, pumpkin, squashes, um, papaya. Although we don't ferment papaya, but um, it's a wet seed. Um, so the basic uh, way to do it is you would cut the fruit in half. Um, and you can uh, scrape out on the left, you'll see this is a cucumber. Um, you would scrape the seeds out either with your fingers or a spoon um, and put them in a colander, rinse them off and dry them a bit. Um, uh, and I'll show you when I do uh, my tomato seed uh, demo. Um, I kind of rinse them off in this, uh, under the water, tap it out, and then I put a, a dish towel underneath to kind of dry as much liquid as I can from the bottom of the screen, the sieve, sorry. And then they would go onto a coffee filter. Um, um, the one on the right, this is a Costa Cuke, a cucumber. And um, uh, the, the, the coffee filter helps absorb some of the excess water and the seeds don't stick to it. If you put it on a paper towel, a lot of times the, it will, the paper towel fibers will stick to the seed, making it a little bit messy uh, to separate them. And you always want to uh, label and date. And actually it's, it's fun too, if you put where the seeds were grown. 
uh, your town uh, or somebody, you know, where, wherever they were grown. Um, it's good to know that. Okay, so then you would uh, dry them in an airy location out of the sun for, you know, up to a week. And then you would transfer the seeds to a small plate or a little uh, boat like I showed you, and they would go in your dry bucket. Um, uh, they can be stored in the dry bucket. Um, you know, you can actually store them in the dry bucket indefinitely, but you would have to keep, um, you know, eventually re reactivating your silica crystals. So it's kind of nice to dry them uh, till the card, the dry card turns blue, and then you can transfer them to a little container. And you can see uh, this is the process I did with Costa Cuke. Um, dried them on the uh, coffee filter, and then I put them uh, in my dry bucket, and the card turned blue after a while. And so uh, once that did, uh, determined that they were dry, then I put them in a little jar labeled and stored in my refrigerator. For, sorry to interrupt. Okay, for the, and now uh, for uh, we're going to the... talk about processing tomato seeds. So um, is this where you wanted them to be in the breakout doing this or? I think so, but wait, there's a question, Donna. Oh, Julian has a you. question. Can you hear him? Oh yeah, just a quick question. When you put the... Can you hear, can you... uh, oh wait, she can't hear. Can you hear? Now I can. Okay, Julian has a question, Donna. Okay. Um, so after you dry the seeds on the countertop out in the open air for a week, and then in the picture there, you put them in the bucket, are the silica crystals below the seeds? I, I yes. couldn't tell from the photo. The crystals are at the bottom of the bucket covered with a piece of paper towel. Gotcha. Perfect. And then you would put your seeds on top of that paper towel. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So... Debbie, were we doing this uh, at the same time in the in a breakout room, or can I just or should I just do it, or? Um, I think you, you go you go and do it, and then the plan is that we're going to do this activity after the break in breakout rooms. But right now, we want to watch your demonstration. Okay. All of okay. us. Super. Okay. Well, I'll read the directions here, and then we'll go out to my other station, and and I'll show you. So you're basically going to cut a tomato in half, an open pollinated tomato, if you have it. Um, you'll cut it around, cut it in half at its equator. So um, it, the seeds kind of present, the jelly presents a little better when you cut it that way. Then you're going to squeeze or scoop out the seeds and the pulp into a little glass or bowl. Um, add about an inch or two of water so that it's all covered. If you can remove as much pulp as you can, that's fine. Otherwise, just leave it. Um, then you're going to let this mixture sit on your countertop at room temperature for two to five days. Um, um, and if you have an issue with fruit flies, you could put a um, coffee filter over the jar or bowl with a rubber band. Um, I don't usually need to do that. Um, and you may notice that some white mold starts to form on the surface. That's totally fine. Then you will, um, after the you know, few days of doing that, you're going to gently skim off and discard the mold and any floating seeds. Floaters are not viable. The good seeds are at the bottom of the jar um, or bowl. They're going to be the ones at the bottom. Um, then you're going to rinse the seeds in a strainer to clean them thoroughly and remove all the pulp, whatever pulp is left. Um, and then you'll place the seeds in a single layer on a coffee filter on a plate uh, and the plate is to add structure because the wet seeds on a coffee filter it, it's too um, limp or whatever you can't so you need them on a plate and I'll show you that and then you're going to dry them for about a week um, just on the coffee filter on the plate uh, out of direct sun and then when they're dry you can feel it might not even take a week depending on the humidity in the air um, if you can feel them and they feel dry, then they're ready to go into your dry bucket. Okay. So, okay, I'll move to my other station and we will do the tomato demo. Awesome. Yay, this is so fun. Are you guys ready to get your hands dirty and save some seeds? 
Yeah. <laughs> Put your fermented seeds up to the video if you have them. If not, that's all good. Yay! Ooh, those look nasty. You just you take a screenshot. Everybody put theirs up and we'll do it real quick. Ready? Get your seeds. Smile. Yay. Thank you. Do you want to speak and see sure. if they can hear you? Can you folks hear me? Yep. Excellent. Okay. Well, don't worry if you didn't get a tomato. You can do this another time. Um, but if you have a tomato, um, that you haven't cut yet, um, we can we can we can do it anytime. So mm -hmm. this is old Brooks. I'm gonna hold it this way. So it's look how big this tomato is. I'm not kidding. This is a winner, <laughs> and um, it got a little damage on it because it was growing in a cluster so close together. But you can see minimal cracking, one little crack, no stings from fruit flies. It's been a great tomato to grow. So I'm going to cut it around the equator. I do. I don't think my spoon. I don't know what to do with it. Let's see. Okay. Fee, can you run get me a spoon? I think I, I might be here. Yeah. It should be here. I think. Oh, sorry. I'm just using my fingers. Okay. Don't worry about a spoon. <laughs> if you don't have one, you're just going to use your fingers. You can squeeze. See how the the jelly comes out and the jelly is around all of the seeds. So I was gonna say the reason we like to ferment um, wet seeds is the fermentation process helps get rid of that jelly coating, which um, that jelly coating is there to help prevent the seeds from sprouting inside the tomato. Um, and I will save this to eat later. Do you wanna maybe hold one seed up in your hands? Oh yeah, okay. Okay, so around every seed is a little sack of jelly. That is a sprouting inhibitor. And um, do tomatoes grow when they fall under the plant? Yes, they do. We see that all the time. But sometimes they're not that healthy of a plant um, compared to, well, and there's an experiment for you. You know, try growing uh, one fermented and one non-fermented uh, tomato plant. See what happens. So you're just going to, you know, give it a little squeeze, get as much of that um, jelly with the seeds as much as you can. And you're going to put it in a bowl or a little jar. And I'll add a little water. And I will label this. Always keep a little masking tape and a uh, Sharpie. Sorry for the wrong camera. Okay, now this is labeled. And I'm gonna just set this on my countertop. And like I said, if you have an issue with fruit flies, you could always put a um, coffee filter over it, um, but it should be okay. Um, every, maybe once or twice a day when you notice it, um, give it a little swirl and that'll help um, kind of separate the pulp from the seeds. And, uh, and here is one um, that I did just three days ago. And you can see there's kind of a little bit of mold forming at the top. Can you show the side from the side? The what? Oh, the ones at the bottom. And the the seeds are at the bottom mostly. Um, one thing about the fermentation process is it kind of helps to dissolve that jelly. Now um, I don't see any floating seeds here but if there were I would scoop them out and not save them because they're not viable so then the next step is I you could do this at your sink um, I pour them into a fine mesh strainer okay. 
you know, the seeds out. If there's any chunks of pulp or whatnot, you can uh, get that out of the way. And sometimes it just dissolves and it goes right through the little strainer, which mostly seems to be working. Okay, I have just a little bit of pulp to get out of the way. And then I like to blot it with a towel from the bottom to try to remove some excess moisture. Then we will take our plate with a coffee filter on it. And I like to do this. There's my seeds. And then you can use either a pencil or a pen or a knife and try to separate the seeds as best you can on the coffee filter. And you can see the coffee filter starts to absorb some of the excess moisture. And as these seeds dry, you can separate them even more. There'll be some that stick together, um, but they, they come apart once they dry. And then I, again, would label it. Um, I label everything. So this, I, I, you can write right on the coffee filter too, if you want. Oh. Old Brooks. Okay. And then, like I said, this will dry on your countertop for a few days, and then you can transfer it to um, your dry bucket. And then you can put the whole plate like this right in your dry bucket. Donna, um, if you have any seeds floating or if you see yeah. any seeds that look unusual, what do you do with those seeds? So well, if you see any seeds that look, uh, well, first of all, any of the floaters, you want to get rid of those. But if in your uh, seed saving journey, when you are selecting, not only are we selecting for the best plants to save, but we're selecting for the best seeds to save. If you can see that these seeds are supposed to be this kind of um, beige color, but if I had a seed in here um, like this one, I might not save this seed. It's first of all, it's pretty small. It's a little darker than the others. I don't know if you can see that, but I'll probably discard that. Um, it's kind of small and a little bit wrinkly. Anything that's miscolored or, um, you know, tiny, tiny like this one. Here's another one. Tiny little seed. Maybe it's viable. Maybe it's not. So, uh, you know, you can uh, select your seeds too. Um, you want really just, you have so many to choose from. You might as well, you know, just save the nicest ones. Okay, and while we're out here, I wanted to give you a quick uh, example of um, how to save peppers, uh, pepper seeds. Um, this is another fabulous pepper I've been growing. Uh, this was at my home garden. This is, um, uh, uh, what is the name of this one? I keep forgetting it. Well, I'll tell you in a minute what the name of it is. Um, but for this, uh, for peppers, you're gonna just cut the top off and there may be seeds uh, in there on the top part. You could just tap them out. And then I like to make a slit, a long slit, pry it open. And peppers are such an easy plant to save seeds from. Most of the seeds are in a cone in the center. There might be a few sticking to the ribs, but really that, that was it. Save this to eat later. These are very nice, very sweet. And then it's just a matter of gently prying off the seeds onto a plate 
uh, or you can have a uh, coffee filter on top of your plate. But look at all the seeds from one pepper. I mean, they're really prolific. For all of our educators here, this is a great math lesson in economics and entrepreneurship because one pepper seed can make what, 10 different peppers, let's say, and you can harvest a couple hundred seeds from each pepper. You're talking thousands of dollars in seeds when you save those, right yep. Donna? Yep. <laughs> Now, again, I would look through here and I'd say, oh, are there any ugly seeds or, you know, uh, misshapen, you know, they might not look ripe. Uh, this one I'm going to pull out. It just looks a little dark uh, on that side. So, yeah, don't, you know, don't um, think twice about having to uh, take out some seeds that look a little um, not their best. But look at that, that's from one pepper. Now, um, what I, one thing I wanted to say about pepper seeds is when you save pepper seeds, you want to be saving them from um, a plant that has reached its fullest expression of color. If it's a, if it's a pepper that's supposed to turn green, or that usually green peppers turn a color. So don't harvest it if it's green and it's supposed to actually end up being red or yellow or orange. So uh, with this pepper, it does turn red. So I wouldn't harvest it until it's red. And then I know the seeds are ripe as well. Okay. Do you wanna ask if there's any questions? Yeah, any here? questions about this part before we go back to the PowerPoint? I do have a question about uh, wet seeds versus dry seeds. Is that a question I can ask now? What was it? Well, question, wet seeds versus dry seeds. Can you ask that question now? Oh, sure. Um, is, is the drying process the same for wet and dry? In other words, do we store both of them in the fridge or is the yes. fridge only for wet seeds? No, the, um, so they are done. Uh, the only difference with wet seeds is the fermentation part. At the beginning. At the beginning. And then right. after that, it's the same. It's, you know, you're drying it on a, a coffee filter and then once it's dry after, you know, it's dry at, on the tape countertop or in your wherever, wherever, the, wherever a spot that's out of direct sun, then you're going to transfer it to your dry bucket. And, the, and when that dry card turns blue, then they can go in the refrigerator. There's a question about melon seeds. Thank you. Okay. Melon seeds are probably going to be a ferment as well. Um, any kind of seed that has a jelly coating around it. Uh, cucumbers, melons. Um, I mean, you're lucky if you can grow melons. I, I can't grow melons here. That beautiful plum, uh, watermelon. Last oh, year nice. Nice. Um, so yeah, anything that has jelly in it. Cucumbers, melons, tomatoes. Um, um, well, and like I said, papayas are, um, they're wet and they have not really so much a jelly sack around it, but they're just a matter of rinsing them and then proceeding with the rest, you know, drying them on a plate and then moving them into your dry bucket. Um, I have a question. Okay. So with the jelly sack, uh, when you fermentate it, are we waiting for it to disappear or should it still be showing? No, generally when you uh, soak it, um, the, the soaking, the fermentation process dissolves most of that. Uh, if you saw this time uh, when I was rinsing out the tomato seeds, there wasn't that much jelly left. But if you look where I started, this is the one I just um, cut and put in here. There's quite a bit of jelly in there still. Um, but at the end, after a few days, um, um, it just kind of dissolves. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Okay. And Donna, do you think uh, for the for the jelly sack fermentation, do you think that if um, someone was living in a place that will maybe it took a little longer for the uh, fermentation process, would you like advise people to just ferment their seeds a little bit longer? Sure, if they it's can. If it's yeah, warmer, if it's long. warmer, it kind of depends on the temperature where you're where you are. Um, 
But it, I don't think there's any harm in keeping it in the jar fermenting for maybe up to seven or eight days even. Um, but probably wouldn't do it too much longer than that. You wouldn't want it to break down the structure of the seed itself. Thank you. Uh, and then I just have a question for the whole audience, not for the whole audience, but a question um, that I think would be interesting for the whole audience. Oh, sorry. Um, we can do it when we get back. I think Donna's going to share. Oh, there she is. You going to share the screen again? Yes. How many days are from the Let's see. Is Donna on mute? Yeah, I'm wondering. I'm saying, wait a second. I think the answer to the how long you ferment is when the seeds are ready and they've dropped to the bottom and they're away from the jelly coat. And yeah, that can be anywhere from like two to seven days, she was saying. It, I think it would depend on the type of seed. Can you folks hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Okay. Um, uh-oh, I'm not uh, forwarding again. What happened here? Hang on one second. There we go. Okay. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about um, doing a germination test. Say you've had, you saved your seeds, you, you, you know, they're in the refrigerator. Um, or maybe somebody gave you some seeds. Uh, for whatever reason, you're just not sure. They're you know a couple years old, um, and you're not sure if they're still good. So I like to do a germination test before I invest my fertilizer, my time, whatever. Um, you can test the seeds to see if they're viable or will sprout. So I start with a big plate. And I won't do a demonstration with this. I could have, I have everything to do it, but I think I can just explain it. Um, I start with a big plate and a, a paper towel and I fold the paper towel long ways. And I like to try uh, 20 seeds, but you could do 10, you could do you know less. Um, and then uh, I arrange them in kind of two rows of 10. I fold the paper towel over and I put a little water on the plate to saturate the paper towel. Then I gently roll up the paper towel like a jelly roll. And then I put it in a coffee cup with a piece of foil over it. And I'll show you that. Um, the picture on the left, this is how Nancy Redfeather uh, did uh, her recent germination test. She had, she had a bunch of older seeds that she wasn't sure about. So she has um, one, two, three, four, five, six different seeds she's uh, trying uh, for doing a germination test. Um, so that she does hers like that. And maybe she puts the whole plate in a bag. I'm not sure. But when I've tried to do um, sprout seeds on a plate, uh, on paper towels or in a roll, even like that, if I don't cover them, they dry out really quickly. And if you're not checking it all, you know, every day at least, um, they could dry out. Once they dry out, you need to, well, you can try to add more water and see if it'll um, work. But usually once it dries out, it's, it's not good. Um, so some people fix this issue by putting the whole plate in a paper uh, plastic bag to retain moisture. But how I do it is I put my little jelly roll in a coffee cup and then I put foil over it. And I check it, I try to check it every day. Um, but this method has worked for me and it, um, it, it retains moisture pretty well. And then um, depending on the type of seed, some seeds take 
10 days to germinate. Um, some seeds need to be soaked first, then do a germ te germination test. Um, um, if you're doing something like lettuce, they're, they're very small. So that's gonna, um, you know, take a little uh, patience to uh, do that. So the seeds that tiny. Um, so after you have, um, after about three or four days, you can open up the, gently unroll the paper towel to see if they are starting to germinate or not. Um, you might see that some haven't started yet or some look, they look like they might not ever germinate. They might be duds um, or they're, you know, whatever number of them will be germinating will have done that by just depending on the time. It could be three days, it could be 10 days, it could be 12 days. Um, so you'll just have to monitor your germination process. Um, at the end of that time, when all of the seeds have sprouted that are going to, um, you basically uh, take the number of seeds that sprouted, you multiply that by 100 and divide that number by, well, I use the example of 20, but you would divide it by the number of seeds that you started with. And that will be your germination percentage. Um, and again, depending on the, what you are um, trying to uh, do the germination test on, um, some things have a notoriously low germination rate. Um, so that will, like I was saying about my, um, my marigolds, I don't know why, but they don't have a very good germination rate always when I, when I do a germ test on them. Um, but um, I also see them sprouting under the marigold plant from just the seeds that fell. So um, I think it's, you know, maybe sometimes I might've been using seeds that weren't fully developed. So they would have been immature and that would have caused a low germination rate. Some, uh, especially bean seeds might need to be soaked overnight first. Um, so, and then once, uh, once they do germinate, I usually plant them. So I can't waste seeds easily. So I'll plant them um, at either my yard, my garden at home or the farm where I work. Any questions about germination tests? I have a quick question. I've noticed Donna that, um, especially with tomatoes when we germinate on paper towels, there's a, a set of them that come up quickly and look really good. And then they're almost ready for planting and there's another set that's slower behind. And I was always taught from the beginning, just ignore those guys, the slow ones. Yeah. Is that what you do with the germination test as well? Yeah. Yes. So every step of the way from selecting the fruits, the best fruits that we're gonna save the seeds from to selecting the seeds that are the best looking seeds and calling out the weird looking ones to our germination test. Um, the, the most vigorous, promising uh, future plants are going to be those seeds that germinated quickly. That shows vigor and strength, and those are the characteristics we want to take into the future. That's exactly what, and it's a little hard, a little, you know, sad sometimes, because <laughs> we always want to root for the underdog. I'm like, come on, you can do it. I'm going to plant you anyway. And, you know, a lot of times those ones are maybe more disease prone. So really we, you know, it's to our advantage to um, be a little picky about what we save and what we plant. Donna, somebody asked about um, if you have to ferment the wet seeds. Um, just repeat the question. Yeah, so the question that we just got is, do you have to ferment wet seeds? No, you don't have to do anything, but you're going to get a better, uh, more disease resistant seed if the if they were fermented, so that that jelly sack is fermented off. Um, it just uh, the the plants from the seeds that have been fermented generally do better than seeds that have been planted directly um, without fermenting them. So I hope I answered that question for somebody. Okay, any other questions about germination? Okay. 
Okay, so here's an example. This was a Kentucky Wonder Pole beans I had. I have so many seeds at home. Um, you know, I, I have to check them every so often to see if they're still viable um, before I plant them. So just here's the little formula that I used. I planted 20. Uh, I think I soaked them overnight too. So I soaked them overnight and then I put them on a paper towel, um, folded it in half, rolled it up like a jelly roll, had it in a coffee cup with the foil on top. And after, I don't know how many, uh, oh, this was day three. At day three, they had 70% germination rate. But then I, I covered it up and I rolled it up again. And on day five or six, they were 100% germination. They all sprouted. So it pays to give it a little bit of time, um, but not like anything that hasn't sprouted by time the other seeds have a good size sprout on them, ditch those duds. Just don't bother with them. Um, but so here's the formula. So if you planted 20 seeds, 20 seeds would be 100% germination. If 14 sprouted, so I multiply 14 times 100 and divide it by 20 and you get 70%. So that's a pretty good germ rate. Okay, and then, um, so storing the seeds, they can be stored in the drying bucket with silica crystals until the dry card indicates blue. Then they can be moved to a tightly sealed container and stored in the fridge. Make sure all seeds are labeled and dated. Seeds are best stored in cool, dark, and dry conditions like a refrigerator. So to reactivate the silica crystals, there are little, um, uh, they call them, um, what do they call them? The uh, indicating beads. Um, and the one, the silica crystals that you folks got, I think have orange indicating beads. And if they are, um, when they get saturated, I think they turn green. Um, but um, this was the directions on that package that yours came out of. Um, so when those indicating beads turn a different color from what they look like now, you're gonna put the, you're gonna empty your dry bucket out, take whatever's in there out, um, carefully pour the silica crystals onto a coffee sheet. Uh, yeah, cookie sheet, so sorry. A cookie sheet um, or a baking dish, and you're gonna bake in a low temperature oven, 250 degree, degrees. It says on the, pack, on the container, it says up to three hours. It's never taken me longer than you know, 40 minutes maybe. Um, and then you see the, when, once you heat it up like that and dry it out, those indicator crystals will go back to orange. Um, and then you would put it back in your bucket, put your seeds back in, put the lid on. And I was gonna say one thing about the, um, this bucket, um, the lid does not have to be sealed, like jammed on tight as if I had paint in there or some kind of liquid. It can just set on top and that's enough of a seal. Uh, for that container. Um, so, and then you can also use a microwave. Um, I don't have a microwave, but um, if you did, um, you can do it in a microwave and you can also look online. There's um, directions online as well. It's probably on YouTube also, probably. Um, any questions about reactivating silica crystals? They use silica crystals, they call it silica gel, but as you can see, there's nothing gel about it. So I call them silica crystals. Um, they're traditionally used for drying flowers. Um, you would you know, put a whole flower head or something or petals or something in there. Um, so you can find this uh, silica crystals, besides online, you can find it at um, um, Ben Franklin or some other craft store. Um, you guys have a Michaels on Oahu? Yes. Oh, no. Okay, I thought you might. Anyway, they sell it in the craft department. So. But Donna, the amount that everyone has, they can use those forever, right? Not forever, but you can use it for a long time. I don't know how long it lasts. It might be a couple of years. You're, um, at some point, if you're reactivating it, re you know, at some point it just won't, those indicator beads, uh, won't change back to orange. 
but you can but you but they can still dry again it's just that you won't have the confirmation that they're dry that i don't know okay. i haven't been anyway. doing it years yet so i don't know okay any other questions about the silica crystals okay well i i have a question okay um what is what's rh it's relative humidity oh oh on the card okay yeah i see what you're saying okay okay and so when it's measuring the relative humidity and it has okay it just says where mold grows and where it doesn't grow mm -hmm. okay because I know when there, you talk about seed drying, they, they want you to get to a certain percentage before you put it in the fridge or the freezer. Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering what percentage uh, this blue indicates, like um, how dry are your seeds, you know? I don't know. I know I have a hydrometer at home and I'll put that in my bucket sometimes um, just to check against the card. Um, um, and I can't remember off the top of my head. Maybe Marielle, do you know what the percentage was? The okay, I know I've I've known it because I've used my hydrometer, but I can't recall it right now. But um, all the thing about these dry cards, they're just so ingenious. They were um, they're made at UC, UC Davis. You just look at the color, and um, from having the card in your dry bucket, when you take it out, that's the color that blue that deep sky blue. And when you take that card out of the bucket, it doesn't take long at all. And it starts to turn, you know, lighter, lighter, then it starts to transition to pink and then it's pink. So kind of just getting an idea of what it looks like when it's dry, that would probably be your best indicator. But you could Google the, um, the number for a hydrometer. I mean, you could Google like, what's the um, number supposed to be the percentage of, uh, humidity or dryness. Thank you. Yeah. Super helpful. Oh, good. And again, if anybody has questions about any of this that comes up later, once you're doing the work, um, feel free to reach out to the team and they can uh, let me know. I can help, um, you know, answer any questions that I might not have covered. Um, uh, let's see. Anything else? Tyler, are you ready? Well, wait, we have one more slide. Oh, okay. This is the most important slide. You can't miss it. Yes. Okay. So you have, a lot of you may have heard of Michael Pollan. He's an amazing, uh, you know, um, writer uh, and researcher. So he says in his book, A Gardener's Education, he says, um, seeds have the power to preserve species to enhance cultural as well as genetic diversity, to counter economic monopoly, and to check the advance of conformity on all its many fronts. This refers to only being able to get a fraction of the seed that we once had in our diverse, um, uh, you know, uh, the seeds and the plants that we used to grow because of shippability, storability, uh, marketability, whatever it was, that has reduced our numbers to the few that we have now. So save seeds. Save our future. No, <laughs> it just felt like we needed that. <laughs> the title of the workshop. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So, so, so much, Donna. Oh my gosh. My so pleasure. I want everybody saving seeds, so get going. <laughs> okay. Um, Debbie, do you 